my name is Nate Sales, and in this presentation, I'm going to be speaking about building an open source Anycast CDN. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Nate. I'm a high school student interested in software development and networking. I run Autonomous System 34553, which I use for a variety of projects. And recently, I wanted to experiment with content delivery, um, as well as increasing the reliability of some of my public facing services, things like DNS and HTTP traffic. So uh, the overview of the project um, is that I wanted to um, play with Anycast. Um, so I route with multiple next stops and sort of build a CDN that uses Anycast as the routing methodology um, to uh, deliver traffic efficiently. And one of the goals was having fast and asynchronous updates. So if multiple people wanted to change um, some sort of data, um, that would be possible. And then really the main goal was this was going to be a learning experience. So I wanted to learn about new technologies, sort of play with things hands-on, um, really sort of learn about Anycast um, in a um, hands-on way um, and figure out how this stuff all works. Um, one of the um, sort of uh, technical aspects was keeping all content directly at the edge. So no backbone, no IGP, um, no backlog traffic. And this really makes the network simpler um, because there's no dealing with IGPs or um, issues with that, conversion times. And this is all just done talking directly from the edge um, via any cast to those content servers to deliver the content. And then I also wanted to keep everything open source. So if anybody wanted to take a look at the code, sort of see how I did things, um, and think about how they could do things differently, um, that would be possible. And then, of course, one of the requirements was being a student, I needed to keep this as cheap as possible. So I knew from the start that I wanted to run um, authoritative DNS. Um, so I spun up a couple of bind VMs um, and put off the races. Um, DNS is mostly a, a UDP service, and, there, and there's some TCP thrown in there for things like zone transfers. Um, but this makes it very simple for any cast because there's no um, issues with any cast um, state synchronization. Um, one of the problems that people have um, posed um, with doing any cast is that um, TCP state can become um, out of sync. Um, for example, if we have a packet that's going to one server and that then ends up at a different server um, for the app packet, um, then you just get a reset back and the connection drops. Um, that's not a problem with UDP because there's no state. So it's just sort of this um, just packet goes there, no sort of handshake or state sync, um, anything like that. It's all um, directly back and forth. Um, then HTTP, as well as HTTPS, um, I wanted to play with caching. Um, so this is one of the things that um, CDNs do very well, is doing a caching proxy service. So I use Caddy and Varnish for this, um, and that was how I built the caching network. Um, this is, of course, mostly TCP. Um, there is a little bit of UDP with HTTP3 and Quick, um, which I am running on the network, though um, it's mostly TCP. So this, so this is where we start to see problems like um, packets arriving out of order, and packets, the packets arriving at different nodes, um, which can cause issues with TCP services. In terms of control plane architecture, um, the network is designed around a single central control plane machine. And this was built there for simplicity, um, and this just be one of the code. Um, so when the user is going to interact with the network, uh, for example, they want to edit a DNS record, and they're going to be talking to a Flask API, probably through, um, through the user interface. Um, so they are going to talk to UI, and then the UI is going to be sending those uh, HTTP requests um, to Flask. Um, Flask then going to handle storing that data in Mongo. Um, Mongo is the database that I'm using for persistent object storage. Um, this um, stores things like um, DNS records, um, for the uh, caching servers, it stores uh, backend IP addresses of the HTTP endpoints, uh, things like that. Flask is also going to uh, send a message to Beanstalk. Beanstalk is a message queue, which um, sort of acts as a um, temporary store um, for operational changes. And this plays into the um, fast asynchronous update goal that I had of being able to change data and have it queued um, for then uh, the operation that could take longer, like deploying a record to the entire network. So Beanstalk helps with keeping those messages um, queued and staying fast. Um, the second step, um, once the change has been made, um, is the orchestrator, um, which is a second Python process. And the orchestrator is actually going to go um, build templates um, based on the MongoDB config, um, and then it's going to send those out to each edge node. Um, so the orchestrator talks to um, service daemons via um, control signals. So this is going to be things like reloads and restarts. And then the control is also going to talk directly to the file system of each node. So things like um, DNS zone files get copied directly as just file system objects um, to the node. And then and then the nodes themselves, um, they run Linux, um, as well as some service statements like bind for DNS, um, and then caddy and varnish for HTTP caching and proxying. And then also using bird for BGP, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, later. But one of the challenges in building the network was dealing with TLS certificate requests. Um, there are free CAs such as Let's Encrypt, um, which has a, a very nice um, automated um, ACME process, which allows you to um, validate your ownership of a domain and then 
um, have your TLS or GitHub hit um, issued for you. Um, this is quite easy for a single uh, unicast web server. Um, things like CertBot um, make this process super quick and easy. Um, and web servers like Caddy have built in um, Acme clients, which can sort of automate the process even further. Um, and this is not so simple, of course, with Anycast, uh, because their validation servers could end up at any one of your Anycast endpoints. Um, so I designed a sort of three-step process uh, with a certificate controller that acts as like an intermediary, um, which um, handled sort of the issuance of those certificates. And um, then I realized that Let's Encrypt supports DNS. Um, so you can use a DNS01 challenge um, by creating a TXT record for your zone. Um, so I just threw all this code away and just called my own API to add a simple DNS TXT record to validate domain ownership. Um, this was, of course, a whole lot simpler than dealing with a um, freeway handshake with Acme clients and uh, retries and all that. So in terms of the network, um, this is running two fully global um, Anycast networks. Um, the first one is the primary name server, um, which is now from all pops. Um, this is now globally, so multiple continents. Um, and this is the uh, main DNS server. And the second one um, shares the um, secondary DNS um, with the HTTP caching servers. So this is a second prefix, um, which is now in Anycast as well. Um, but only from the larger pops. Um, the reason this is because certain smaller pops um, aren't not really equipped to handle a um, load of HTTP caching. Um, small VMs can handle DNS just fine, but they don't have enough storage or uh, compute to really do um, HTTP caching services. Um, so each one of these is a slash 24 and slash 48, um, and there's just two of them, so two different networks. Um, there's not enough IP space um, that I had on my budget um, to I really go for regional Anycast. So I certainly would have liked to have a sort of single block or a um, pair of blocks per continent so I could scope announcements and to Anycast just a particular geographic region. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't going to work for this. Um, the entire network is fully dual stack, so V4 and V6 everywhere. And you do and do engage in public peering. Um, so this is all, um, the entire network is built on AS34553. Um, so you can see on the right are some of my um, peering DB a, a documented ISPs um, that I appear at. I'm um, load balancing. I'm um, doing a global uh, load balancing with Anycast. Um, so both prefixes are announced the entire internet um, globally, um, and then um, using Anycast, they will um, find their way to the um, closest destination. Um, the way that works, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I'm um, load balancing at a per pop level. And this is based on uh, mostly ECMP. So on the top, we can have um, this uh, BGP route. Um, this is appearing with um, four of the edge nodes. Um, and we can see that there is a route um, to each of them. And then uh, using bird, um, we can see that on the bottom, um, we can see the route um, injected into the Linux kernel, um, which we can see um, we have four X tops uh, with an equal cost, and then we just let um, Linux do um, ECMP flow hashing. And we can see here running 10 uh, DNS requests um, towards the um, towards the Anycast endpoint um, can, um, that does result in a pretty even spread among those four um, DNS servers. So BGP automation is one of the things that's really important uh, um, in a network. Um, the uh, key here is doing simple, uh, repeatable configs um, that can be templated easily and deployed consistently across the network. Um, for this, I designed a tool um, that handles RPKI, um, IR prefix list, and max prefix limits um, uh, pull automatically from PureNDB. Um, this will query um, PureNDB based on the PS ASN and retrieve all this information like the AS set, um, max prefix limits, um, and configure sessions accordingly. Um, the entire config is built um, um, by one file per router. So on the left, we can see a simple 10, 15 line file um, for one peer one upstream, um, which can handle um, filtering and um, session generation all just automatically. And that file can be written in YAML, TOML, or JSON. You can take your pick in your um, formatting uh, language. Um, and the code is open source in GitHub. And this is called a BCG for the Bird Configuration Generator. And um, this is then the tool that I've used and uh, developed for um, BGP automation in the CDN. So in terms of monitoring, um, there are three main strategies, uh, three main strategies that I use. Uh, a central route collector um, is um, sort of the way that I use to gain a just uh, sort of general routing insight into the edge of the network. Um, since there is no backbone, no IGP, um, all of the routers um, have some sort of BGP session on them, um, and so they um, are going to be sending routes to the route collector via uh, IPGP sessions. Um, which can then uh, let me see things like uh, BGP communities and, uh, and other routing attributes. And the second sort of metrics-based monitoring is built on uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Um, this is things like um, just basic stats, things like CPU usage, bandwidth usage, um, number of query errors, um, cache, um, cache hit ratio, um, things like that. 
Um, so Prometheus is my time series database, um, which is then feeding data to Grafana for uh, visualization. And the third category is manual uh, troubleshooting and optimization. And this mostly relates to um, any CAS route being propagated, um, to, uh, being propagated through, through the DFZ. So um, using tools like uh, the LMOG ring and Ripe Atlas um, allow me to sort of run trace routes and pings um, via multiple servers in the world um, to see where any CAS routes are ending up. And this has been very useful in troubleshooting certain routes or um, routing problems and making sure that um, the network is globally reachable um, from every endpoint um, that, um, that I can measure. So one of the biggest challenges that I faced um, when building this network was tuning Anycast. And because both networks are um, fully global, um, they're announced from multiple continents, um, this gets to be quite a beast to tune. Um, the two strategies that I used here are prepends and export control. Um, prepends are um, used sparingly, so I will prepend two or three times. Um, any more than that, um, I will just use export control and cut off the announcement. Um, so for example, things like IXP route servers, um, I generally do not um, send those Anycast prefixes to. Um, because um, there's no way to control where the routes go from there. Um, certain IXPs have communities um, for filtering that, um, but it's a lot easier to just establish bilateral peering relationships um, with the um, providers that I want to peer with, um, rather than trying to deal with um, scoped um, community announcements for IXPs. But one of the things that BGP does not take into account um, is latency and packet loss. Uh, this is certainly important for things like DNS, uh, little HTTP traffic, um, playing into time to first byte, um, which latency really is important. So I developed a tool um, called STPing um, to ping simultaneously from multiple source IPs. Um, this can be used for um, balancing transits, for example. Um, so at a POC with uh, two transit providers, um, I can ping from both of those, um, those DMARC IPs, um, to a common endpoint, and then I can see the normal ping sort of statistics that you would see um, with just normal ping. So we can see things like parent loss, uh, latency, um, which can help me to um, then tune things like prepends um, to influence um, outbound um, route selection. Um, so, of course, prepends for inbound, um, things like, um, things like uh, BGP local press um, for outbound traffic. And that brings me towards the end of my presentation. Um, so I'm always looking for new pops, so if you have some spare uh, VM infrastructure, um, do reach out. Um, this project is um, fully open source, um, so uh, PRs and issues are certainly welcome, and my GitHub link will be at the end. And thank you very much for listening. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm always happy to talk over email um, with people who are interested in this kind of stuff, so feel free to shoot me an email. Um, then below is my GitHub, which contains all the code for this project, um, the SCP utility, um, control plane stuff, everything that was used for this project um, is open source on GitHub to take a look at. So thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, thank you, Nate, for that wonderful presentation. We're going to go to the Q&A section of this presentation. Right now, I have approximately four questions. The first one is from Michael. Nate, did you make the controller piece of the CDN high available? If so, how? Yeah. Um, so in terms of V1 of the code, which so is what I presented on here, um, the controller is just a single machine. Um, so it's not um, highly available. Um, for the um, sort of control plane rewrite that I've been working on, um, it is going to be um, highly available um, using a MongoDB uh, replica set and um, with etcd for a um, sort of um, a, a distributed configuration database, um, which I think should take care of some of the, uh, the initial concerns I have, both have availability and the control plane. Excellent. We have another question from Matthew. Nate, how much disk storage did you plan on the caddy slash varnish boxes? And how do you handle adding space for additional objects when necessary without having to rebuild the entire object cache? Yeah, um, so for the object caching, those boxes have anywhere from 200 gig of storage to a couple terabyte. Um, they're not really consistent. I'm giving them operating with just whatever I can find. Um, so these are um, still relatively small um, in terms of their storage space. And um, if I did need to upgrade, I'd pull them out of rotation, um, drain the cache, and then have to fill it back up again. Next one ultimately is not a question, it's just uh, a comment. Uh, person says, Dave says, impressive. I think in high school, I was discovering girls and forming re a revolution. Uh, HS computers back then were TTY to a local timeshare mainframe, ultimately boring. Uh, Michael 
uh, question is, were you paired to an ISP or an IXP, or was this fully simulated? And this is all uh, real BGP on the internet, um, peering both with transit and um, publicly um, at exchanges. Um, it's telling the system uh, 34553 if you want to check out my peering DB or such. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a simulation. This is um, a real BGP on the internet. Can you repeat that AS number again, please? Sure, yeah, it's a 34553. Just writing it down for myself. Sure. Uh, next question is from Boris. Nate, do you measure the latency by ping only? Um, so there's a few things I measure there. Um, in terms of the monitoring setup with Prometheus, um, that does do um, just raw um, ICMP pings um, to the management IPs of the endpoints. Um, that's, of course, not a realistic test in terms of what your actual services will be looking at. So I'm also doing um, basic uh, service daemon uh, health checks. So things like checking in with Caddy, um, timing the um, full sort of time to first byte, um, that latency, um, DNS, of course, um, the entire time of um, from DNS request um, or a DNS query to DNS response, um, and measuring the latency it takes to complete the entire um, the entire request um, all the way up to layer seven. Um, so I'm uh, trying to get some realistic um, latency measurements by um, going all the way up to those layer seven daemons. Excellent. The next one is not quite a question. It's uh, more of a comment. Uh, it's from Matthew. If you hadn't realized you're doing a distributed interview at the moment with companies vying for your future, kudos for catching the level of attention in high school. We have approximately two minutes left. Uh, if there's going to be any more questions, please send them now. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as I had said before, please fill out your surveys. Uh, we value every single survey that comes in. It gets read, we go over it, and we talk about it and provide feedback to that. Uh, winners of the survey could win a $100 gift card. So please get your surveys in by visiting nanog.org slash surveys. Want to be internet famous? We are looking for presentation proposals for Nanog82. Visit nanog.org slash presentations. Trivia, trivia games are fun, especially if you've been paying attention. Trivia will be held right after this presentation, um, which is the first break. And sponsors will be giving out some awesome prizes to winners. I got one more question here. How did you get involved with Nanog and what pushed you to do a talk? Yeah, um, so I've known about Nanog for a while. Um, during this sort of um, COVID quarantine time, um, I've enjoyed uh, watching a bunch of past Nanog presentations. So I think that was my big motivation was um, seeing some of the really cool things people are working on and then gaining some experience in sort of presenting my own work. Um, this is the first time I've done something like this and I just really wanted to I try something new and um, get myself out there. Excellent. And Adam has another question. How many nodes do you have in your CDM? Currently, um, the node counts about 40, 41, I believe. Um, anything from a single VM with like one BGP session um, to multiple servers, um, like I talked about, both ECMP. Um, so that pops range in size, but yeah, it's about a 40 nodes at the moment. Last question. Uh, awesome. You have given so much thought to using Anycast for the front end of the CDN. Are you doing anything to improve past selection and reliability between your CDN nodes and content origin, origin infrastructure? Uh, yeah. Um, so currently, um, the communication between um, the a uh, server actually serving like the origin content uh, goes uh, not through Anycast. That's just um, direct to Unicast via um, unique IPs for each node. Um, for example, in um, the Varnish uh, caching cluster, um, each of the nodes is going to have a unique uh, Unicast IP, um, which sort of um, helps with simplicity um, in things like TCP retries. Um, so I'm going to hold that TCP um, connection open for as long as possible um, with the origin, um, which this, of course, doesn't work great with some of the previous versions of HTTP. With things like HTTP2, um, we can open a TCP connection, keep that stream open, and just force traffic down it, um, which, of course, helps with some of that uh, the initial TCP 
um, connection latency. Um, so yeah, it's uh, unicast in the back end for communicating with the origin. Excellent, Nate. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Nanog, thanks you for your proposal and presentation. Thank you.